Hello, and welcome to the State Bar of Arizona's 2021 convention. My name is Tim Igo, and I'm the editor of Arizona Attorney Magazine. We just heard our phenomenal keynote speaker, Jarrett Adams. And I must take a moment to thank our phenomenal sponsors. Our diamond patrons are law firms, Lerner and Rowe Injury Attorneys, Tiffany and Bosco, Berg Simpson, Jennings Strauss and Salmon, Perkins Cooey, and Carnes Law Firm. And our top tier corporate sponsors are LawPay, Thompson Reuters, Monesk, the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law, and Wealth Council. As always, we appreciate these sponsors who make this event and so many others possible. Be sure to send them some love and check out what they have to offer. So we've just heard Jared Adams' compelling keynote address. Now we get the opportunity to hear from him in a more relaxed setting. With Jarrett in his home office and me at home, I'm pleased to speak with him for a short but deep dive into his story, his goals, and his ideals. Jarrett, welcome. Thank you guys for having me, man. I really of appreciate course. it. Now, I know you're very busy and you're, you're always racing between uh, obligations and clients and a million other things, so I appreciate this chance to catch up with you. We'll probably keep this to 20 or 25 minutes and then uh, get on with our days. Thank you. Uh, last year, uh, Jerry, it was my pleasure to help uh, convince you, I guess is the word, to be a keynote speaker at a national legal conference. And your remarks there were uh, very moving and remarkable as well. Um, in that dialogue, you said that when you speak about your experience to others, you are getting your testimony out. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, why do you feel that America and decision makers need to hear your story and that of other exonerees? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important because you, you, you can have empathy and sympathy for things that you can relate to. So if you can't find the empathy and sympathy in things, then you can't find it in your heart to be compelled to want to do something, whether it affects you directly or not. And so what I'm able to do is this. People say, well, I'm an attorney. He's an attorney. That's the relatability. So now that I have you there, let me explain to you how difficult my journey to become an attorney was that makes it unique for, for myself. And so when I'm able to catch people in that spot, that's when I'm able to humanize the criminal justice system, sometimes for the very first time. And so we can't get to the political slogans of reform and action until we get to the sympathy and empathy that the criminal justice system has robbed of the very system that it calls the justice system. Right. That's absolutely true. So, and, and tell me, and the stories of the exonerees, I think um, hopefully some of our attendees today have heard some of those stories and, uh, and you feel like it's important to tell these very American stories about what happened to them. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, what I find is this. So I started a speaker series called Life After Justice, conversations with Jared and it's gonna be a number of different individuals in and around a criminal justice system. But the kindred spirit amongst the, 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 the exonerated population is this. You know, I can't stay mad because it's me in prison just minus the bars. And so what I'm doing is trying to bottle, bottle that, that self-reflection and, and, and mental awareness that the trauma you suffered will continue to make you suffer unless you're able to deal with it, right? So by then, in me, I should say, Zonaree is able to tell our story. We're able to deal with it more and more. And then I'm able to compartmentalize it to other people in my genre now, my field, attorneys, to say, hey, look, so you can see it's not just me, Tim. I'm not an isolated situation. Although I may have become an attorney, Dr. Salam didn't. But that doesn't mean that his life wasn't as, as important as it is now, as it should have been to our system when he was being adjudicated. Yes, absolutely. So let me expand this beyond you and the exonerees. 
to some of the um, injustices and indignities entire communities have faced. And I yeah. know you've spoken a lot about this. 2020 was, a, a well, I guess, a revealing year uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, for white Americans, it may have been a revelation to see racial inequalities up close and personal. Of course, for African Americans, it was no news at all, right? Yeah. Um, but can you describe uh, what 2020, including the murder of George Floyd and violence against others, what did 2020 tell you about where America is at? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it said it said a couple different things. Um, number one, um, I like to find you know the, the the points of synergy and energy and things that happen, and, and they don't happen you know just because. So, if you can believe that the pandemic happened and it forced everyone, everyone to sit down and to watch that man's life slip away under the knee of someone who had the slogan, serve and protect, branded on their arm um, next to their department brass's name. So what it did was this, Tim. It made people who may have been on the left and may have been on the right understand that the only place to truly be in criminal justice is in the middle with justice and equality. It made people say to themselves, you know, maybe there is some credence to the, 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 the stories that we're hearing that are coming out of the impoverished areas that we don't live in. Maybe we should start taking a second look and listening and understanding that our police, our community relation, whether you are on this side or that side, I think the numbers can all suggest that there's something wrong. Okay, so I think that that situation forced America to look in the mirror. Because it wasn't just America who was forced in the house to watch that. The entire world was forced as well. You know how, Tim, we're lawyers, we're professionals, we're, you know, full-time moms, dads. News is flying by. Sometimes news is jurisdictional. Sometimes people aren't home at 5.30 to see, you know, the nightly news or anything like that. Not many people would have saw a man, a grown man crying for his mother if the pandemic wouldn't have happened. So I look at 2020 and I say to myself, I know I'm speaking for the mass of, of people who went through it and experiences, which is the entire world. It was exhausting, Tim, but it was a cleansing process that I pray produces the opportunity for us to really handle the situation that continues to find itself bubbling up in the fabric of America each and every other day. And that's tragic, but true. So uh, um, we've heard from you already a little about your, your path, your journey, um, and congratulations on that. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. you have only so many hours in a day. So you're, you're, you've are you become a lawyer, you are creating a national practice, um, and yet you decided, you know, life after justice, I, I should do this. So what was the impetus to say to yourself, right. I need to do more, I need to d dive deeper than whatever the most recent trial that America is gripped by. Mm -hmm. What drove you to do that? You know, Tim, if I can let you see my inbox or listen to some of these voicemails. I and, bet. You know, and, and, and it's like, you know, uh, I've seen a lot, right? Um, even as, you know, doing the work as a lawyer in the criminal sector of appeals, you know, I've seen a lot. But there's nothing that, that can bring me, you know, to my knees like, like, like hearing a crying mother, you know, talk about her son. Um, because it reminds me of my mother, you know, and what we went through. And so I didn't create Life After Justice because I needed more work, that's for sure. Um, I did it because I realized that my firm is making money now. So am I going to become the person that I'm saying needs to start helping? Or am I going to be the person who I wished I had a 17 year old Jared being sentenced to serve 28 years in prison. So we're making money. We're not gonna make the same, you know, overlooking 
of the problem that's staring at us in the face, right? And so that means this, pro bono in our firm, we're not having a conversation about a case unless at least 50% of what pro bono services we resource are going to tackle a problem in the criminal justice system, right? That's the all hands on deck approach. That's a necessary approach. You gotta understand this country was founded by litigators on litigation. So do you think that we're just gonna stumble our way out of what happened to George Floyd without litigators doing it? No, no, no. See, we gotta stop some of the Christmas parties and some of the expensive stuff. And we gotta say to ourselves, how much longer until this spills over in my community? You know what? Let me stop this right now. Everybody, let's have a meeting. We have 100% pro bono pool. This is our pool. One third of that right now is going towards the state level transformation of the criminal justice system to really have real reform. Criminal justice reform isn't on a federal level. It's on a state level. And I'm not trying to give anyone a con law lesson, but I think everyone knows exactly what I mean. The state level is where it needs to change. If every big firm who does pro bono decides to commit a third or higher to tackle pro bono criminal justice issues, we'll start to see a lot of changes, Tim. But we'll that's, see. That's absolutely true. So, and, and I should tell all the uh, people watching, in case you haven't already seen it, the uh, website you should go to is lifeafterjustice.org. There's a lot of great information there, places to get started, ways to connect with Jarrett. Um, now, Jared, I recently watched the first interview you did in the Life After Justice series. It was yeah. very moving, and it was with Dr. Youssef Salam. Uh, could you briefly, for all of us, describe his uh, tragic and high-profile story? Right. So Yusuf is, uh, Dr. Salam, he is, people know him as, you know, the Central Park Five or the Exonerated Five or When They See Us from the Netflix documentary. I know him as Yusuf. You know, I met Dr. Salam in 2007. Um, I met him and I met him at an Innocence Network conference. And so we're at this Innocence Network conference and this Innocence Network conference is a conference that all innocence organizations get together and they, they bring, you know, their clients who have been exonerated. And it's just a real therapeutic moment. And I'll never forget that when I was there, they were trying to figure out what law school that I was there with because that's how young I looked. I had just been released less than 30 days before this conference. So the conference was in March. I was released in February of 2007, and I still looked like the kid I was. I was 26 turning 27 that year, and it wasn't until during the program of the three days there, second day, when they put all the exonerees on the stage to say, hey, you know, exonerated, blah, 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 that they realized that I wasn't a law student at all, that I was the youngest at the time exoneree attending the, 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 the conference. And so with him, he saw my maturation from bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, damaged kid who had suffered, you know, the worst of the worst, like he had did, to now an attorney, you know, with the law offices in New York, Illinois, Wisconsin, and one on the way in California. And he's hearing about the cases. He's seeing what I'm doing. He's viewing me in court. And he's saying to himself, my God. He called me the other day and he told me, he said, I don't know if you can hear it, but Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and a gang of others are cheering along with Thurgood Marshall because you are what we've been missing. Now, I don't know if he's putting all this pressure on me to make me fall apart, but I'm going to do the best that I can to fulfill um, those high praises. So when I, I see him and when we see each other, we see how far we've come with the, in, with the intimate knowledge of it. And that's why you see the smiles on our faces when we talk about each other. Yeah, and I got to say, um, you know, there were so many moving moments in your interview of him. And... Uh, that is high praise he's giving you and well-deserved. Uh, the only other one I heard him speak of so highly uh, was his mother when he said that she was mm -hmm. his Harriet Tubman. I mean, mm -hmm. so all the founding fathers and mothers, uh, you, you're in the same category with his mom and, and them. So, his, And not just that, Tim. So his mom, 
like so many other mothers of the exonerated, they are the pillars. And in fact, look, let, let this not, for the African-American community, the, the, the foundation has been Black women, period. There's no argument there. And so through his struggle, through my struggle, we saw our moms rise like Phoenix, you know, through the ashes, through the fire that was created as our interactions, both Yusuf and I, first interactions as kids, it could have destroyed. And this is the opportunity to present in front of the bar and talk to you right now, Tim. Do you know my mandatory release was February 2020? What was my mandatory release from prison? Wow. That's incredible. Wow. Well, and others, and, and, and you talk about your own story uh, and, and what you had to learn in prison about how had, you had to take responsibility for your own legal case. That alone is fascinating. Uh, but I want to get back to one thing um, Dr. Salam said mm -hmm. in your interview of him. Uh, he said he's still healing all these yeah. years later. And speaking with people, as he does, is more than just public speaking. It's about continuing to heal. And I was wondering if that resonates with you. And, and I... Uh, I guess my question is, is reliving the hardest moments of your life in a ballroom full of people, is that a burden or is that rejuvenating and healing in some way for you? Or is it both? It, it, it's a bit of both. Like, it's not easy to go back and relive all of this stuff because as I'm taking folks through the slideshow presentation, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking myself back down memory lane and it, and it hurts sometimes because it's difficult to, to, to see that this almost didn't happen. It almost couldn't have happened. It almost it took so much for me to get here. You know, it's, it's scary sometimes. But I look at it like this, Tim. If it pains me a little to keep someone from hurting a lot, then I'll take the pain. Well said. Very well said. So, uh, Jerry, you've said before that um, communities of color feel, as you described, a blanket of hopelessness or mm -hmm. have felt it. And, and for a long time, we as a country have tried to gloss over our history of inequality. Does the fact that it's now bubbling to the surface, as you put it, um, does that give you hope or concern? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it does give me hope. And look, look, Tim, we gotta have hope. We have to. We, I, don't want think, I don't want people to, 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 to believe, oh man, burn the whole house down for a few insects. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is this, can we, can we stop? this political madness and get to the heart of, of, of fixing the problem. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, like Tim, I, I just, I can't stress this enough. There's a time for politics, then there's a time for not, okay? And I'm not all times a time for poli politics, for, and I'm talking about both sides. I'm not talking about one side, I'm talking about both, okay? Look, you know, at what point I'll give you I, the best way for me to, to, to say this is to say this. Um, we we had and I, and I mentioned this you know during my presentation, you know we had a war on drugs where we dumped all of these resources, you know, on locking people up, and we locked up, you know, mass people, the majority people of color. Why we see that that didn't work, Tim? We know it didn't. So now that we know it didn't work, then explain to me. Where can I purchase my ticket for when they start the process of mass education, of mass resources, of mass jobs? So then maybe in these communities of color, we can start producing mass educated folks, mass folks with skills, mass opportunities, and then we can get out of this mass mess. Absolutely true. So, you know, uh, I was struck by one thing you said um, when you talked to Dr. Salam. And, um, and, and, and maybe this is a good place for us to end up for all the people watching. Yeah. And, and we'll get into um, something that they should do. Uh, you said that we, we all, all of us, will have to answer to future generations about what we did to fix a flawed criminal justice system and to improve our nation. What should lawyers and legal leaders be doing to help make things right? Look, lawyers 
should be having a conversation about their use of pro bono funds. You know, that's what this is about. Tim, I wish this was about something else. I wish it was just you and I can go to CVS or Walgreens and get it at the checkout counter. That's not where it is. It is in, it is in people's hearts in their wallet books next, okay? So when you have these firms, go play this tape. Bring me in. I actually like Arizona, okay? Come fly me down and let's have a conversation. And I'll, I'll, I'll do my research about the jurisdiction in which the law firm is in. And let's, let's have a conversation about what you can be doing to affect right where you live. Tim, it's, it's, it, I want people to, to, to really walk away with it with this. Um, there's nothing that has happened in the United States or in this world of significance with just one person, with just one group, okay? The civil rights era, there were people of all colors who were running from German shepherds and getting sprayed by water holes, okay? It, it, it was not the people we see making the decisions who were on the ground who said, we're not gonna go away until we can sit up out here at this counter and eat like everybody else. So that was the torch that was passed to us to be able to have events catered by Corner Bakery and all of these other places and shrimp cocktail. So here's what I ask you. Do you think the people who passed us the torch will be as happy with us right now with what we've done with it? Do you think that the books that you read as a kid that depicted our forefathers in that positive light, do you think your kids are going to read that same depiction of you and what you did and what your firm did in this criminal justice conversation? And if you can't say that you feel comfortable with what your kid could read about you 20, 30 years from now, then there's some work to do, my friend. Those are some hard but important questions. Uh, Jarrett, I, I, I thank you. And I, I would uh, suggest to everyone watching that uh, besides asking yourself those questions, as I will do, uh, and besides examining your pro bono approach, um, I'd also remind you that pre-orders are available now for Jarrett's book, which will be out in September. Uh, it's titled Redeeming Justice from Defendant to Defender, My Fight for Equity on Both Sides of a Broken System. It's available everywhere you can buy books, and I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Jerry, any final thoughts for people who share your concerns yeah. and who yearn to make a difference? Yeah, my, my final thoughts are this. Um, you know, as I want you to just think about, you know, again, you know, I, I touched on this, but I'll touch on it again. Think about when something in your house, you know, breaks and you're not able to afford to fix it. So you find a way, right? Uh, because you know how it works. I mean, you know how it works, so you find a way. And so I say that to say this, the people who are closest to the problem, they know how to make it work, but they just don't have the resources to fix it. You need to find those people and find the resources to help those people fix the communities that are producing the community relations between police and George Floyd. With that, I mean, I thank everyone who took the time, the opportunity to listen to me. And I can't thank you, Tim, and the Arizona Bar enough. And I pray you guys have me again. I'm sure we will, Jared. Thank you so much. Thank you for your insights, for your generosity and your courage to share your story. Uh, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Be well. Thank you.